Well, I did it by assembling a wonderful group of people. I, when I started doing trading, I had gotten a little tired of mathematics. I was in my late 30s, I had a little money, I started trading, and it went very well. Uh, I made quite a lot of money, I, with pure luck. I mean, I think it was pure luck. It certainly wasn't mathematical modeling. But in looking at the data, after a while, I realized, hey, this looks like there's some structure here. And I hired a few mathematicians, and we started trying to make some models, just the kind of thing we did back uh, at IDA. You, you design an algorithm, you test it out on a computer, does it work, doesn't it work, and so on. It turns out, uh, in the old days, and this is kind of a graph from the old days, uh, commodities or currencies had a tendency to trend. Not necessarily the very light trend you see here, but, but trending in, in, in periods. And if you decided, okay, I'm going to predict today by the average move in the past 20 days, there's 20 days, uh, maybe that would be a good prediction and I'd make some money. And in fact, uh, years ago, such a system uh, would work. Not beautifully, but it would work. So you'd make money, you'd lose money, you'd make money, but this is a year's worth of days. And you'd, you know, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd make a little money during that period. But you know, try all those things and see what worked best. But the uh, trend following would have been great in the 60s and it was sort of okay in the 70s. By the 80s, it wasn't such a... Well, way. we stayed ahead of the pack by finding, by finding uh, other, other approaches and uh, shorter-term approaches to some extent. But the, the real thing was to gather a tremendous amount of data, and, and uh, we had to get it by hand in the early days. We went down to the Federal Reserve and copied interest rate histories and stuff like that because it didn't exist on computers. We, we got a lot of data and very smart people. And uh, that, was the, that was the key. I, I didn't really know how to hire people to do fundamental trading. I had hired a few, some made money, some didn't make money. I, I couldn't make a business out of that. But I didn't know how to hire scientists, because I have some taste in that department. <laughs> and uh, so that's what we did. And uh, gradually, these models got better and better and better and better. Some of it was money. Uh, <laughs> they made a lot of money. I can't say that, that no one came because of the money. I think a lot of them came because of the money, but they also came because it would be fun. Well, in a certain sense, what we did was machine learning. Uh, you, you, you look at a lot of data and, and you try to uh, simulate uh, different predictive schemes until you get better and better at it. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily feed back on itself the way we, we did things, but uh, it worked. We take in terabytes of data a day and uh, store it away and massage it and get it ready for analysis. And uh, you're looking for anomalies. You're looking for, like you said, uh, you know, the, the efficient market hypothesis. But, well, any one anomaly might be a random thing. However, if you have enough data, you can tell that it's not. So uh, you, you, you can see an anomaly that's persisted for a sufficiently long time so that the probability of it being uh, random is, uh, is not high. But these things uh, fade after a while. Anomalies can get washed out, so you have to keep on top of the business. Well, actually, I think in the last uh, three or four years, hedge funds have not done especially well. We, we've done dandy, but the hedge fund industry as a whole has not done uh, so wonderfully. The stock market has been on a roll going up, as, as everybody knows, and uh, uh, price earnings ratios have grown. So an awful lot of the wealth that's been created in the last let's say five or six years has not been created by hedge funds. So uh, it's just another, you know, people would ask me, what's a hedge fund? And I say, one in 20. I mean, which means <laughs> now it's two in 20. But, you know, it's 2% fixed fee and 20% of profits. Hedge funds are all different kind of creatures. People got very mad at my investors. How can you charge such high fees? I said, okay, you can withdraw, but no, how can I get more was what the, <laughs> was, but how, how, how can I get more? But at a certain point, as I think I told you, we bought out all the investors because there's a capacity. Uh, there's a capacity. To the it's not just mathematical. We, we hired astronomers and physicists and uh, things like that. I, I don't think we should worry about it too much. It's still, it's still a pretty small industry. And in fact, bringing in uh, science into the investing world has, has improved that world. It's, it's reduced volatility, it's increased liquidity, uh, spreads are, are narrower because people are trading that kind of stuff. So I don't, I'm not too worried about Einstein going off and uh, uh, starting a hedge fund. Yeah, we, we are. It, it, Marilyn started, uh, there she is up there. 
a beautiful wife. She started the foundation about 20 years ago, I think 94. I claim it was 93, she says it was 94, but it was one of those two years. <laughs> <laughs> we started the foundation. And uh, just as a, as a convenient way to uh, give charity, uh, and she kept the books and so on. Uh, and we did not have a, uh, a, a vision at that time, but gradually a vision emerged, which was to focus on math and science, to focus on basic research. And uh, that's, that's what we've done. And six years ago or so, I left Renaissance uh, and went to work at the foundation. So that's what we do. Instead of beating up the bad teachers, which has created morale problems all through the educational community, and in particular in math and science, we focus on celebrating the good ones and, and giving them uh, status. Yeah, we give them extra money, $15,000 a year. We have 800 math and science teachers in New York City in the public schools today as part of a core they're, they're, uh, there's a great morale among them. They're staying in the field. Uh, next year it'll be 1,000, and that'll be 10% of the math and science teachers in New York public schools. Uh, and, and that's, uh, well, I'll save that for a second, and then I'll tell you what you're looking at. But, uh, so origins of life is a fascinating question. How, do, how did we get here? What's, what's a root? Well, there's two questions. So one is, what is the root from uh, uh, geology to biology? How did, how did we get here? And the other question is, what did we start with? What material, if any, did we have to work with on this route? Those are two very, very interesting questions. The first question is a tortuous path from, uh, from geology up to RNA or something like that. How, how did that all work? And the other, what do we have to work with? Well, more than we think. So what's pictured there is a star in formation. Now, every year in our Milky Way, which has 100 billion stars, about two new stars are created. Don't ask me how, but they're created. And it takes them about a million years to settle out. So, in steady state, there's about two million stars in formation at any time. That one is somewhere along this settling down period. And there's all this crap sort of circling around it, dust and stuff. And it'll form probably a solar system or whatever it forms. But here's the thing. In this dust that surrounds a forming star have been found now significant organic molecules. Molecules not just like methane, but uh, formaldehyde and cyanide, things that are the building blocks, the seeds, if you will, of life. So that may be typical, and it may be typical that uh, planets around the universe start off with some of these basic building blocks. Now, does that mean, oh, well, there's going to be life all around? Maybe. But it's a question of how tortuous this path is from those frail beginnings, those seeds, all the way to life. And most of those seeds will fall on fallow mm. planets. You know, if that path is tortuous enough, and, and so un improbable that no matter what you start with, uh, we're, we could be a singularity. But on the other hand, given all this organic dust that's floating around, we could have lots of, lots mm. of friends out there. Be great to know. Mm -hmm.